thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sindhil, Dr. Suresh Balan, Dr. Rajendran, Dr. Namalai, Dr. Elisami, and all friends in IAP. I'm not sure whether I deserve all those words of appreciation. Thank you very much. I'm humbled by your uh, uh, very uh, exaggerated introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, I have to declare a conflict of interest because I am an advisor for the ACVIP 2020 and 21. And uh, this session, which is sponsored by Biological E Vaccines, is a sponsorship for the IAP. And uh, there is no honorarium for me. And uh, I'm not taking part in this session as an advisor for the ACVAP. And whatever opinions I express are all personal opinions. These are not the opinions as an advisor for the ACVAP. The focus for uh, today's uh, session on enteric fever would be like this. I'm going to dwell with uh, what happened to enteric fever in the past, what is happening to enteric fever today, how the world has changed, how enteric fever has changed. In quite some time, I'm going to spend some uh, 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 cases with personal experience, and I'm going to share some data from our own institution. I'm going to express some unorthodox views, absolutely personal experience-based and not research-based, may not be always evidence-based. And necessarily, I have to talk about typhoid vaccine and particularly about the new entrant in the market. I'm going to predict the future of entry fever in India and the world. This is going to be the flow for the session. Entry fever, what has happened in the past? Somebody mentioned the, the name of Typhoid Mary. From the time of Typhoid Mary, it is there to haunt the developing countries. There is hardly any enteric fever in the United States, America, UK, Japan, and certain developed countries. Whatever salmonella infections they see are all non-typhoidal salmonella coming from contaminated animal food and milk rather than contaminated water producing enteric fever. But unfortunately in India, it has killed a lot of people due to enteric fever and its complications, notoriously the perforation. If you look at the global distribution of typhoid fever from 2000 onwards, you see here the, the Indian map is in the red list with a lot of cases, something very high incidence of over 100 per 1 lakh per year. And global Typhoid cases have plateaued with 11 to 18 million illnesses and about uh, nearly about 1.28 to 1.9 lakh deaths per year. It is causing deaths and most of them due to intestinal complications and shock. So it is still continuing to cause significant morbidity and mortality, though it has also come down in many developed countries and not in countries like India. Coming to the estimates of typhoid burden, you see here from the year 1996 onwards, if you see the estimates, there's only a gradual uh, reduction. The number of illnesses has been somewhere around 16 million and still hovering between 12.5 to 17 million in the recent past. Unfortunately, it continues to occur in the same number. And if you look at the data from Africa, Asia, it is said that the number of blood cultures being positive for typhoid fever, most of them had occurred below the age of zero to four years, 27 percent. That means every fourth uh, case of enteric fever in the world is occurring in children below four years of age, a very vulnerable age. And around 2.9 percent had occurred uh, below the age of six months. So it's not a disease confined to older children and adults as thought previously. Significant number of cases do occur in infancy and in the toddler's age group below four years of age. If you look at the typhoid occurrence statistics, we realize that it's not uncommon below six months and the occurrence increases steeply between six and 12 months of age. And it can be severe 
below five years of age to cause significant mortality and morbidity. What is interesting and disturbing to read in the literature is that only 4% of individuals suspected to have typhoid fever had con culture confirmed typhoid fever. That means if 100 people had been suspected to have typhoid fever, only four of them end up having culture positivity and the, between the, uh, the, out of the 96 remaining, many of them get treated as enteric fever without blood culture. So there is a definite lack of, not culture, but lack of blood cultures across the world. That's what is happening. And if you look at the data on enteric fever today, there are some new things happening. All of you would have read emergence of multidrug resistance, which occurred about uh, 15 years back, ciprofloxacin resistance. Then we talked about uh, uh, analytics gas resistance. And time has come now to talk about septrioxone resistance also. So that is something which is very disturbing for the microbiologists and for the infectious disease experts. Interestingly, I'm quoting something from our neighboring nation, not a friendly nation, Pakistan. In the year 2019, the Pakistan Infectious Disease Society met and came with new guidelines for enteric fever. In fact, other than India, Pakistan perhaps has got one of the highest burden of enteric fever cases in the world. So it is natural for us to accept our neighbors correct definitions, which are actually very, very interesting to read. In the definition, what they have done is to disagree with the earlier WHO definition. In the earlier WHO definition, they used to divide it into probable enteric fever and confirmed enteric fever. And the term probable enteric fever was given to those cases who had five days of fever along with antibody positivity in the form of Vidal or Typhidot or any of the antibody tests. But look at what the Pakistanis have done. They have removed the antibody test from the probable or suspected case of typhoid fever definition. I thought that's a very, very recent definition which we also need to accept. The reason why I like this definition is because we are too much dependent on Vidal and the new type dot for diagnosis of typhoid fever. So here, they are given a definition that a patient with documented fever of 38 degrees for at least three days, with rising trend in clinic and having no other cause for the fever, or a compatible case that is epidemiologically linked to a confirmed case of typhoid fever, is called a probable or suspected case of typhoid fever. In fact, in most rural areas, this will be the definition which will be occurring to most of us. Confirmation because blood culture or bone marrow culture or urine culture or stool culture positivity in somebody who's got fear for at least three days. Chronic carrier, they are given a definition. So this definition is very, very useful in that it has removed the usefulness of Vidal in one stroke. The other interesting thing is the new definition given by the Pakistan Infectious Disease Society. Again, it, it makes interesting reading. They have classified typhoid for the clinician into four groups. I thought this is very, very relevant today for us also. The four groups are non-resistant typhoid fever, multi-drug resistant typhoid fever, extensively drug resistant typhoid fever, and they have now introduced a new term called ESBA right here. I will dwell with them individually, briefly. Non-resistant typhoid fever, I, I would say is the good old typhoid fever caused by S typhoid or paratyphoid A, B, or C, and which are sensitive to first-line drugs as well as third-generation cephalosporins. That means you can use any drug for them ampicillin, amoxicillin, cotrimoxol, cefixim, anything you can use. That is non-resistant typhoid fever. You don't see them very often, but they are given a definition. Second is multi-drug resistant fever. We are very familiar with that, where 
these strains are resistant to first line drugs but they are sensitive to third generation cephalosporin cefixim and ceftriaxone extensively drug resistant typhoid fever like extensively drug resistant tb is typhoid fever caused by s type i which are resistant to all the three groups ampicillin amoxicillin chloramphenicol cotrimoxol and also your cephalosporins fortunately most of them are sensitive to azithromycin till date i'm not sure when azithromycin resistance is going to be reported in a big way the last definition is elsbl positive typhoid fever now recently they have identified the fact that salmonella typhi and parrot typhi can produce esbl and they can be resistant to third generation cephalosporins like some of the e coli in the urinary tract infections but they may be sensitive to surprisingly the first line drugs including chloramphenicol cotrimoxol and even ciprofloxacin this is a new entity which pakistan has introduced i have not come across this strain in our hospital but other centers in india have reported this new new group this group is important because if you if you get a report from the lab it is esbl producing typhoid there is no point in giving cephalosporins you, you can straight away if the patient is not allergic to cotrimoxol you can consider cotrimoxol or you can try the good old ciprofloxacin in high dosage or ofloxacin not of course norfloxacin it is useless if you see the recent reports of resistance the dangerous extremely drug resistant typhoid outbreak had occurred in pakistan and uh, our one of our indian companies vaccine manufacturing company supplied millions of doses to the karachi city and other cities in pakistan to vaccinate children fortunately it is under control this year in south asia more than 800 people across pakistan have been infected with this extremely drug resistant strain and i am worried that this strain may walk into india very rapidly and cause a lot of problems for us till now it has not happened what is new in the pakistani guidelines is regarding the dosage of drugs in fact cefixim can be given in a dosage of 400 mg per bd in that uh, recommendation but there are references which have said that you can go up to even 800 mg bd if there is an obese child weighing 70 kg adult dosage is minimum of 400 mg bd mosquito doses of 200 mg bd won't work we have to use 20 mg per kg and you can go up to 400 mg bd in pediatrics and if it's an adult you can go up to 800 mg bd safely that's one the maximum dose of ceftriaxone is 2 g bd the ideal dose is 50 mg per kg bd or 1 g per kg od not more than 4 g per day but what is interesting in the recent recommendations from pakistan is that you can go up to 1 g of azithromycin if there is an obese child having entry fever if you are using azithromycin you can give 1 g od for 7 to 10 days but most textbooks including harrison's mentions that if you want to use azithromycin in entry fever you start with the loading dose of 1 g in an old child or an adult followed by 500 mg od but this guideline from pakistan says you can give azithromycin in an obese child weighing more than 60 kg 1 g for od for up to 7 to 10 days this is something new with this i will move to share some of my personal experience and publications in entric fever and share the recent data on entric fever from kkcdh in the year 1991 when i was in ramachandra from poru we published the, for the first time in south india chloramphenicol resistance to the tune of 80 to 90 percent this was 1991 so look at the figures most of them were resistant to chloramphenicol ampicillin cotrimoxol and etc in 2009 we analyzed our data in child stress 
And we found something very different, which again we published in Indian Journal of Pathology and Microbiology. What look at what has happened here? The chloramphenicol sensitivity has come back in a big way. The resistance has dropped down to around 10 to 20 percent. On the other hand, nalidixic acid resistance is going up. This is what we found. So here, nalidixic acid resistance is not there. This has emerged in 2009. Chloramphenicol sensitivity had come back. Ampicillin sensitivity had come back. Reverse. That's what happened in 2009. So in about 249 isolates, we found nearly about 80 to 85 percent were resistant to chloramphenicol. That is the time when we started using ciprofloxacin. When we started using them at 10 milligram per kg, fever used to subside in three days. But then again, the trend changed in 2009. Ciprofloxacin resistance, usually reported as nalidixic acid resistance in the laboratory, went up to around 80 percent in the year 2009. So big swing from one way to the other way. This is what happened. With this, let us look at some of the case scenarios with some take home messages. This is a child who had fever for four days, five days, not improving, vomiting and a few loose tools. The pediatrician suspects enteric fever on clinical grounds. He is wondering what to do to investigate to do blood culture, to do typhoidot IgM, Vidal, or blood culture and typhoidot IgM. You must be wondering what must be the correct answer. My answer would be only blood culture, blood culture. There may be a tendency amongst many of us to add typhoidot IgM. Of course, very few will continue to do Vidal, which is irrational, particularly on day four of fever. If you look at the principles of diagnosis of enteric fever, culture of culturing yet to become a routine. We do CT scans for COVID positive children unnecessarily, but we always say we don't have lab facilities to do culture. I think that's not, that's an excuse. You have many good laboratories from city picking up culture, giving culture bottles, back techs are available. You will get a report within 48 hours. Even in the most remote village in Tamil Nadu, we can definitely do a culture before starting therapy for entry fear. I don't think there is any excuse. Typhi dot, if at all you want to do the IgM antibody test, is best reserved for fever after five days. And it has got more sensitivity than specificity. On a personal scale, in our unit, we don't rely on typhi dot. We rarely do it at all. And I would say wide all fever is still prevalent. Slide test, one in 80, day four, will be rounded. And uh, mosquito doses, cefixim is often prescribed. It should not happen. I call it as Vidal fever rather than enteric fever. And in our unit, we have stopped doing Vidal. I, in fact, uh, see if my PG writes, I strike it off. We don't do Vidal at all in our unit. We go by cultures alone. And if in doubtful cases, patients has received multiple antibiotics outside, you have no diagnosis. We always do the practice of doing a bone marrow. That helps us two ways. One, it rules out malignancies. And it also picks up the typhoid bacilli, even if there are five per ml. So even small loads of bacilli will be picked up if you do a bone marrow. If you do a bone marrow for a PUO, it's not enough. If you ask the pathologist to see, you must send a culture for enteric and non-enteric organisms. The rapid test already, I said, they are clinically, they are inferior to clinical judgment. It should be supported by conf confirmatory evidence from culture. Ideally today, Cochrane Review, WHO, everybody says don't offer it. PCR has got potential, but it has not been standardized. So the best practice should be clinical judgment. We must do a blood culture, start antibiotic. The fever comes down in 24 hours, it's not entry fever. Wait for the culture. The fever persists. Use your clinical judgment to continue or discontinue antibiotic if culture is negative. Leukopenia with eosinopenia may give a clue. Blood culture is the gold standard. Single titer of Vidal, you must intelligently interpret if it's an agglutination test. If it is one in 320, I wouldn't ignore if somebody has done it. That too in the second week. But it's a slight test done in some big lab, I wouldn't rely on it. 
we need to know more about pcr we'll know sure for uh, for sure in future case 2 4 year old fever 6 days spleen tip stable child total count 4600 eosinophil 0 urine routine blood culture sent what do you do do you wait for cultures give only paracetamol start antibiotic or admit and start step trioxone antibiotic cefixim ofloxacin azithromycin and coalition therapy cefixim for us plus azithromycin what do you do for the dilemma for the clinician when he is confronted with a case like this where this is possibly enteric fever on clinical grounds and minor laboratory criteria you are rightly asked for a blood culture how do you decide on antibiotic the dilemma we all face is how do you choose the first line drug are we going to use one drug or two drugs and most importantly typhoid fever enteric fever doesn't come down in 3 to 5 days in fact today today they test our patients patients test our patient the disease also tests our patient it takes about 7 days for the fever to come down and you have to take a decision whether you are going to change a drug and if so when what drug you use and why do you use this in a recent study which has disturbed the clinicians and which has disturbed conservative physicians like me in nepal they used a combination of cephalosporin with azithromycin and they came to a conclusion that those given a combination of cefixim and azithromycin the bacteremia cleared earlier and the duration of fever was less this was the report from nepal this tends to support dual therapy isn't it but let us see what our opinions are earlier 2004 2005 in our unit we used to give only one antibiotic for enteric fever there are other senior physicians who used to give a combination of either cefixim with ofloxacin or cefixim with azithromycin like that so we just wanted to find out whether it is going to make any difference to use two drugs so what did we do we studied these cases retrospectively and we found out the total duration of fever in both the groups single drug versus multi drug groups was not significant it was same 13.54 in fact in the single drug group it was slightly lesser by 0.3 0.3 days that is what we found out in addition to that we also looked at the time taken for deferrence of fever in the single drug group it was 5.24 in the multi drug group it was 4.32 so to reduce the duration by about 0.9 days do you have to add another drug that was the question and this we reported in the indian journal of pediatrics and this is quoted by the association of physicians of india in their treatment regimens as one more reason why we should use only one drug for enteric fever and not two drugs for enteric fever so we concluded that single drug therapy is as effective as dual drug therapy so as of today there is no need to give two drugs two antimicrobial agents for enteric fever anywhere in the world case number 3 this is a child who was 5 year old who had fever for about 8 days fully immunized toxic hepatosplenic megaly was there there is no anemia the child had mild ichthyosis urine was yellow clinical jaundice is made out total count 4600 again eosinophil zero blood culture some signals are there lab within 24 hours they told us sir some signals are there something is growing bilirubin was 3.8 their indirect was 1.8 ot was 368 256 was the pt so the ot was more elevated than pt our dilemma is this viral hepatitis or enteric fever if it is viral hepatitis there should be no growth in the blood and already we had done hepatitis a b and c all negative is it enteric fever to solve this dilemma we did we carried out a study comparing the levels of serum alt sgpt with ldh and we found the ratio is very very useful in differentiating typhoid and viral hepatitis if you see the ratio 
the serum alt lth ratio in typhoid is always less than 9 whereas in viral hepatitis proven ig igm positive a or b it is more than 9 why does this happen typhoid fever causes ischemic hepatitis ischemic hepatitis when there is ischemic hepatitis ldh goes up much more than sgot and ldh goes up much more than sgpt also so the higher elevation of ldh in typhoid causes a lesser ratio whereas in viral hepatitis the alt is very high ldh is not very high the very high but the alt is very high and it tends to be more that is what we found out and we published it in indian pediatrics so if you have a patient who has got jaundice who has got fever hepatomegaly you can do an ldh and also get a blood culture if the ldh is very high it is likely to be typhoid whereas if the ldh is not very high and pt is very high it is likely to be viral hepatitis so it's not a gold standard you have to do viral markers and blood cultures also case 4 this is a very unusual case a 6 month old infant who had fever bouts of crying for just one day from morning the mother came with bouts of crying not a bulging fontanel no other signs counts are normal we did a lumbar puncture to rule out meningitis absolutely normal then 24 hours later we got a call from the microbiologist sir it is gram negative salmonella typhoid and child completely recovered with septraxone then we went to the literature and this is the first case of pseudo tumor cerebri in an infant due to typhoid very unusual we are fortunate to get this reported in annals of tropical pediatrics coming back to personal experience and some expression of what i would say as unorthodox views i share with you the protocol we follow in our unit in kkcts with a caveat please do not follow this just because we are following this we are following this as a policy for the last 5 years based on, on our own experience and antibiogram what do we do one is that we give ceftriaxone only as in patient we don't administer ceftriaxone as op therapy the reasons are many one if the patient is fit enough to go home the patient is fit enough to receive oral drugs the other alternatives are to send the child with an iv line dangerous or to give im ceftriaxone if you don't want your pay next your child to come back again to you you can give ceftriaxone intramuscular it's extremely painful not worth it so as a policy whenever a patient is fit enough to go home we stop ceftriaxone and use switch therapy we do not complete 14 days of ceftriaxone unless rarely we find somebody having salmonella meningitis which is very very rare we don't use two drug therapy at all for enteric fever but of course if you ask me don't you add another antibiotic yes whenever we are in doubt when there is a po 10 days fever no diagnosis we always add doxycycline to ceftriaxone to cover rickets cell infection and quite a few number of times we have been surprised with scrub typhus positivity in those cases recently we determined the fever desorption period with ceftriaxone there have been concerns that ceftriaxone is taking a lot of time for the fever to come down and we found that in our series it is only 3.6 days ceftriaxone is doing a good job the mean duration of desorption is only around 3.6 days this we presented in the international conference on typhoid recently and we follow a peculiar switch therapy what does what do we follow this is where there are going to be controversies what we do in a sick child we admit we give ceftriaxone and then instead of going to going to cefixim we give oral azithromycin in confirmed case of enteric mind you in confirmed cases culture positive cases we don't give cefixim we give oral azithromycin 20 mg per kg od and with this we have handled nearly or 150 cases and we have had only one case of relapse which is lesser than the international figure of around 8% so we believe that this switch therapy 
has brought down the incidence the relapse but i wouldn't advise all of you to follow so the best course of action will be to give ceftriaxone followed by cefixin to complete a total of 14 days though unfortunately in literature this switch therapy has not been validated in enteric fever if the child relapses because we treat with azithromycin in our unit we do not use cotrimoxol or amoxicillin but if somebody wants to use in fact from delhi chitkara has reported in indian pediatrics cotrimoxol could be very effective i would advise giving cotrimoxol to somebody who doesn't have any allergy of cotrimoxol and who has already been re receiving cotrimoxol for some reason or other you can try cotrimoxol if it is sense to amoxicillin 100 mg per kg is not a bad therapy for as a first line in typhoid fever as i said earlier we rely on culture heavily we may do even two or three cultures to identify the bug rather than treat blindly coming to the antibiotic sensitivity percentage the last four and a half four and a half years we have had around 574 isolates and you as you see in the figure most of them are sensitive to ceftriaxone and azithromycin ampicillin and clonopinicol look here ciprofloxacin only around 4% are paratyphine and 1% are ciprofloxacin have been ciprofloxacin sensitive so we don't use any quinolone for typhoid fever in our hospital i wouldn't recommend this also outside and one disturbing thing we have been observing is that the mic for cephalosporins is gradually going up from 2014 to 2019 but the mics are not worrying at the at this point of time i am sure in the next few years we are going to see cephalosporin resistance cefixim resistance ceftriaxone resistance, resistance in enteric fever this is something disturbing as of now we have had full sensitivity for cephalosporin we are part of a national system for surveillance of enteric fever in india where a tier 3 study has been completed and is awaiting publication we took part with around 223 samples and as rightly pointed out here 100% sensitivity to cephalosporin and azithromycin was observed in this study very encouraging so we can get away with cases in tamil nadu with probably cefixim or azithromycin i mean to the last two parts of my lecture necessarily today i have to talk about typhoid vaccine in the 2018 acvip recommendations what did we recommend we recommended that typhoid vaccine conjugate vaccine is recommended from the age of 6 months onwards we reduce the age previously it used to be around 1 year we said it can be given from 6 months onwards and we categorically said only 25 microgram typhoid conjugate vaccine should be given and we said it can be combined with measles containing vaccine like measles vaccine or mr vaccine or mmr vaccine for which there are concerns in the earlier publications and for a child who has received only a polysaccharide vaccine we recommended a single dose of conjugate vaccine at least 4 weeks after the receipt of the polysaccharide vaccine and controversially we said that routine booster is not recommended as of now for want of evidence but this is in contrary to the earlier recommendations this is being debated but as of now till today there is no enough data to say a booster should be given at the manufacturers some of them recommend booster can be given at 3 months but i am not sure whether there is any evidence but i have always been saying there is no other international agency which is recommending a booster for typhoid until we get data this is going to be a debated affair the who recommends typhoid vaccine conjugate vaccine routinely who does not comment on booster doses it says there is no data to recommend booster doses and coming to the new entrant in this the new entrant is the one which is manufactured by today's sponsor b vaccines that is called typhi b and the currently available vaccines are from bharat biotech typbar pida type and uh, there is another one in usa another one in korea 
if you see the comparison, maximum data is available for TCV vaccines, which contain 25 micrograms. And this VICRM 197 is one where the VA polysaccharide is obtained from Citrobacter fluindae. And this is originally, this is originally produced by Novartis and now being modified by BE Vaccines Limited. And uh, as I said earlier, CRM-117 is the conjugate protein. And the major difference is the source of the VA polysaccharide and the conjugate protein when compared to the competitor Bharat Biotech vaccine. And each 5 ml contains 25 micrograms of VA polysaccharide as, as uh, required by the IAP recommendations. And it is manufactured by biological EVANS. And the manufacturer's recommendation are, recommendations are from 6 months to 45 years as a single dose 0.5 ml intramuscular route. They have applied for WSO pre-qualification. I'm sure they would get it. It has been approved by the DCGI. And uh, this vaccine has undergone a clinical trial, which was discussed in the Pedicon recently, where they conducted a randomized control trial comparing with type bar TCB. And uh, the follow up period was for about 42 days. And the zero conversion rates were equal when compared to type bar TCV. Coming to the anti-VI IgG antibody, the titers were comparable, 97 versus 97.7, which is quite good enough. So what these studies tell us is that the new vaccine, which contains 25 micrograms of the <coughs> conjugate product, is probably as good as the existing product and it is safe, immunogenic. Of course, when compared to the competitor, they may not have long-term data because it's a new vaccine. I'm sure the company will generate more data to discuss in future. Coming to the future of entry fever, the last part of my discussion, what is going to be the future of entry fever in this country? is not in my hands, it's not in your hands. It depends on three interventions. Vaccination. I'm sure we have enough money to vaccinate every Indian child with the typhoid conjugate vaccine. It should be a pro thing. Improving living conditions, better sanitation, <laughs> safe drinking water, checking of food handlers in hotels, and improving the economic status of every Indian. Last but not the least, control of antibiotic resistance with judicious antibiotic therapy. If somebody asks, will we ever stop seeing entry fear like United States or Japan? Yes, I'm confident we'll stop seeing entry fever if factors associated with entry fever which includes lower socioeconomic status, overcrowding, illiteracy, living in rented accommodations, washing hands, stopping of open air defecation, good public hygiene monitoring. I am sure in India also we will stop enteric fever from killing our children and adults. Is typhoid incident declining India in India? Yeah, there seems to be a decline over the last five years. And it may be because India is becoming a global economic power. And India has got more female literacy than before. And one of the peculiar reasons is that India has been using more antibiotics than before. So if on day two, everybody receives antibiotics, typhoid will not be detected. So that is also one of the reasons why probably typhoid incidents in records is less than before. And in a recent article in Lancet Infectious Diseases, it was brilliantly written. This week, we are celebrating the Antibiotic Awareness Week. 
and to improve antibiotic stewardship, one of the methods which is available for us is a typhoid conjugate vaccine. You must be wondering how it helps antibiotic resistance, uh, reducing antibiotic resistance. Very simple. If somebody is vaccinated appropriately with an effective vaccine, if somebody has fever for four to five days, I may not consider enteric fever at all as a DD. For example, in the United States, nobody will think of enteric for a four day fever, five day fever. That is because of good hygiene. Same thing might happen in India. So routine typhoid vaccination may serve as a very good tool for as an action against antimicrobial resistance. We might be using less antibiotics to somebody who's got four days fever. We might not think of typhoid. We might think of only viral infection. And of course, I don't have to tell you, we'll think of COVID-19. In future, I'm sure we are going to get lots and lots of cases of azithromycin failure, subtraction failure. Look at this report. They tried azithromycin to somebody with salmonella paratyphoid A. They failed. They had to use ultimately more active drugs. Azithromycin failed. Good treatment, good dosage, it didn't succeed. This might well happen in India very soon. And again, failure to miropinum has been reported in typhoid fever. Let us not think that we have other reagents. Even the best of agents, miropinum might fail in complicated typhoid fever. So drugs like imipinum, miropinum, astrianum, which are recommended for multi-drug resistant typhoid fever may not work in every case as seen in this report. I would conclude by saying that we should all dream a day when ventric fever should not be in the top differential diagnosis list for any child with fever. In fact, the old tropical medicine book used to quote that in developing countries and countries like African countries and India, anybody who has fever for more than four to five days, typhoid must be the number one diagnosis. I only hope and dream days will change that enteric fever will become a rare cause of fever and not the commonest cause of fever for more than four or five days. Thank you very much. And if there are any queries, of course, you can mail me at svsp.gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation as usual. And uh, you have uh, dealt very detailedly about the various presentations, the vaccinology, and uh, your uh, personal experience also in KKCTH. And so thank you very much for your uh, presentation, sir. I think we'll move on to the uh, question and answers. I think Dr. Suresh and Dr. Rajendran, you can take up the questions or uh, if there are any questions by the delegates, they can unmute. Sir, uh, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, Professor SP, sir. So one yes, question sir. from Dr. Choda Varapu Ravi Kumar. Is there any diagnostic utility of paired Vidal test with fourfold rise with the first Vidal done as early as possible to save delay in doing the second viral test. Very interesting question. Uh, Vidal is becoming like Manto test. I'm extremely confident in the next 10 years, Manto will be abolished. Manto test will be abolished. Okay. So we are looking for crutches to walk. Instead of doing two repeat vidals, I would send two blood cultures to the patients and treat rather than do repeat vidal. But what the, the learned uh, uh, doctor is asking, if I were to answer scientifically, if an agglutination test for vidal is done properly, 
with the correct method and done in the same laboratory with the same technique if there is a fourfold rise in titer it can be taken as probable evidence for enteric fever and not confirmatory evidence for enteric fever but it is painful for me to see we i'll tell you practical experience recently we had a child who had fever for about 7 days fourth day vidal has done 1 in 80 culture has not done fifth day covid 19 was done child was positive got admitted we got a culture done we started on septraxone next day the labs gave a signal of gram negative it was salmonella typhoid but unfortunately outside it blood culture was not asked for i think we should see we should do blood cultures rather than rely on vidal okay but then again somebody wants to do, i i won't agree with anybody who says we don't have facilities for blood culture you see when you have ct scan when you have mri we may have dmsa scan i don't understand we can always have outsourced labs to come and collect a sample for blood culture before starting antibiotic if you don't have facilities even for that don't depend on vidal use it intelligently in select cases if you don't have any facility you are working in a primary health center with no no labs nearby then perhaps you can do a naglutination vidal after 7 days but a negative vidal or a positive vidal should not influence your decision making on treatment it is you should use your shrewd clinical judgment again i would say that wo 1 in 60 or has been the cut off which may be present even in normal population which can occur in uti which can occur in so many other gastrointestinal diseases it's highly non specific yeah uh, next one uh, uh, one question from palani raman trend of enteric fever cases admitted over the past 5 years in your center are they declining or status quo as you have already told it appears to be declining trend of enteric fever cases admitted in past five years sir yes, yes. so you are able to follow yeah 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 see a uh, good question dr pani raman as usual expected from you yes there is a decrease in number of cases particularly this year with covid 19 we have seen very few cases of culture post proven enteric fever the last few years yes we have been seeing lesser cases i would say as a practitioner also i have been seeing less cases of enteric fever i do not know whether it is because of vaccination again <laughs> it could be anything yes we are seeing a decline agreed So another question is uh, supra resident is uh, everywhere supra plus resident resident is everywhere in india, in india see right now uh, i i showed you there is a national sentinel surveillance of enteric fever the data generated there suggest that nearly 90% in india 90% of strains in india are probably resistant to supra fluxus Superfluxacin has no place in the treatment of enteric fever in children today, hundred percent. Unless you have a lab proof, lab proof. As I said earlier, only five to ten percent are sensitive to superfluxacin. They don't work. Doesn't work. So nobody another, should, nobody yeah. should be using superfluxacin or ofluxacin as the first line treatment today in India. So another one is how useful is blood culture if child is already on antibiotic for four days but without response? Will it be useful, Dr. Anna Malay Vijayakumar sir? Yeah, excellent question. Excellent question. So I think, see, you must remember the culture positivity depends on the number of bacilli. If you have a good number of bacilli circulating in the blood. blood culture will pick up the organism but if you have already given antibiotic if the child is continuing to have fever and toxemia 
it is very likely that the bacteremia is persisting and you should do a culture in fact some centers in mumbai some hospitals in mumbai corporate hospitals simultaneously draw two samples for blood culture one from here and one from here just like infective endocarditis and if you draw two samples like this your yield goes up by another 10% and in fact even we when we have a child with pvo we do two sets of blood culture at two different places the yield goes up you should do because if you get the organism it gives you proof if you don't get it then you will have to work up like pvo with the bone marrow in fact we have had cases where blood culture has been negative and finally bone marrow culture surprising us surprising us saying it is normal at type right so every effort should be made to obtain a blood culture if possible two blood cultures rather than one blood culture outpatient maybe one blood culture is enough inpatient probably two blood cultures particularly in difficult cases will definitely come for help we should do it sir i got uh, i got some question sir first one in your uh, center sir you showed the culture sensitivity patterns wherein cotrimox zone was having a sensitivity of 98 to 100 percentage are you using cotrimox zone in your center if not why extremely good question uh, the number of papers on successful treatment with cotrimox zone the number is very small because i told you dr sitkara from delhi has reported many in uh, delhi my own good friend uh, uh, dr jagdish in bangalore uses we don't use it for the simple reason in most guidelines cotrimoxyl is not recommended as the first line treatment in case my child develops steven johnson syndrome i won't be able to defend myself why did you give cotrimoxyl when he have sensitivity to cefixin or azithromycin it may be a very uh, what you call uh, silly answer but i always prefer to use the first line drug the most uh, safe drug probably cefixin or azithromycin rather than cotrimoxyl we do we don't use that at all but if somebody wants to prescribe there is evidence that it can be used but it is very difficult to justify why you prefer to use cotrimoxyl over cefixim in the individual patient okay sir so one more question regarding the vaccines as you have told for the control of enteric fever three things are important one is living conditions second is vaccine third is prevention of antibiotic resistance why vaccine is not included in the national immunization schedule extremely good question but you are asking the wrong person i am not uh, uh, vijay baskar the health minister tamil nadu part of this question <laughs> no the, sir sir you are you are part of the advisory committee no sir <laughs> no, no i'll tell you i'll tell you in fact yesterday in one of the webinar for parents i remarked that with the amount of money politicians spend on hoardings banners and all functions you can vaccinate the whole world with them proper conjugate vaccine typhoid conjugate vaccine having said that typhoid conjugate vaccine is a safe vaccine and as recommended by the iap we can use any of the 25 microgram typhoid conjugate vaccine available in the market safely and uh, the cost will come down if the government starts using it but i am sure the next few years in fact i am expecting the study uh, on the national uh, surveillance sentinel surveillance to be published uh, very soon in international journals with that i am sure the government of india would also include typhoid vaccine in the national schedule there is a big need to prevent typhoid in children and with the availability of uh, conjugate vaccines which are safe which are effective for which we have good data including the new entrant there is no reason why we should not introduce typhoid conjugate vaccine in the public schedule it's definitely needed i would agree with you dr balak so what's the upper age limit for tcb vaccine sir 45 both the manufacturers including the b vaccines new entrant 
has uh, have approved uh, up to the age of 45 years. But if somebody above 45 also off baby, if you want, you can take. I don't think it should harm. Safe what vaccine. is the sense? Yes, sir. What is the sensitivity of blood culture in the first week of illness? First week. See, if you look at the sensitivity, even in the best of centers, is only around 70 to 80 percent. 70 to 80 percent. If you do in the first week, first week. But again, depends on so many factors. Now, with back tech, the chances of picking up uh, entry are very high, very high. We don't do any more of those like, old agar uh, 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 cultures. Back tech is very, very sensitive. And it's available everywhere. At least there is one back tech machine in every other uh, 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 town nowadays. Sir, again, uh, Dr. Palni Raman, uh, one question, sir. In your center, how many suspected treated cases of entry fever are culture positive? How many suspected? Uh, 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 Dr. Palni Raman, I don't have uh, offhand data on it, but I can tell you, suspect among suspected cases, at least around 70 to 80 percent will be positive. 70 to 80 percent. And if you draw two cultures, the percentage may go up by another 10 percent. Sir, one funny question I want to ask you, sir. Please don't mistake me. In your center, you are giving typhoid conjugate vaccines to all children. Yeah. But why then do you have a lot of cases of enteric fever admitted in your center? <laughs> See, the, the cases, in fact, uh, the cases which get admitted there, they all come from different parts of the city, outskirts and districts. We have uh, uh, no control. We see, how we, don't, we are not like CMC where we cater to only surrounding villages. We get cases from Tirchi, Madurai, Madurai, Tirnal Valley. In fact, the, ca the cases come from Pondicherry. We don't have control over vaccination everywhere in India. How do you expect me to ensure that every pain the only thing i do is whenever possible i always advise typhoid vaccination to every patient who's getting discharged from a hospital if the age is above six months that's what i can do it's impossible for me to uh, to prevent typhoid in the community working in a private children's hospital with limited financial resources okay sir. yeah thank you sir yeah. thank you sir uh, i would like to um, appreciate the presence of uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Mr. Jeevan Kumar uh, Mudgala, the Vice President of Biological E, who has joined and uh, welcome him. And I would play us on record that uh, uh, for supporting us, I extend my and for the support, invaluable support. And I would uh, request to request him to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Namaskar Vanakkam from my side. Uh, uh, it was really, really wonderful for uh, me to be present here and uh, listen to deliberations from all stalwarts. Uh, Dr. Bala always has been an authority and uh, uh, it was very illuminating uh, session for me from the treatment perspective. Uh, and I know that the Indian uh, pediatricians are the best on earth. That is why, despite all the environmental challenges we face, we still manage diseases. From our perspective, sir, just to share quickly, biologically has been in the uh, vaccine and pharmaceutical business for many, many decades. We were one of the first companies in India to start making vaccines. And uh, we are very uh, grateful and gratified to share that all the vaccines we make uh, are WHO pre-qualified. And uh, the latest entrant from our side, Typhi Bev, also is undergoing the process of WHO pre-qualification. Uh, we are committed to immunization and protection of lives through vaccines. As Dr. Bala said so truly, that it is unfortunate that just a fraction of children in India, even today, get the benefit of vaccines. And we hope and we are committed to do everything we can to ensure that more and more children get vaccinated. We have been a major uh, supporting partner with the National Program of Immunization for all vaccines. And I, I too dream and hope that typhoid becomes part of the National Immunization Program at the earliest. Till then, it is all of you who share the burden of vaccinating as many children as you can. From our side, 
our commitment is we will make vaccines which are uh, you know meeting the highest standards of safety and uh, immunogenicity and we are continuing our clinical uh, study programs with uh, our vaccines including tifibev as and when our follow up studies and long term uh, protection studies uh, build more data we will definitely come back and share with uh, all of you and with iac with these few words i will thank uh, the august gathering here once more one last remark from my side is sir that uh, just to uh, very happy to share with you that we are also working like many other companies on covid uh, uh, challenges so there was a recent development from our side that uh, we are developing in collaboration with icmr uh, equine uh, covid anti sera in addition to covid vaccine programs we hope that in the coming months we will be able to uh, bring some useful products to the entire humanity thank you again sir to iap tamil nadu to dr bala to all the doctors here for giving me the opportunity it was wonderful to be here thank you thank you sir one question to you sir with regard to the price of the vaccine yes sir what is the price of your vaccine sir sir our uh, i mean uh, uh, the only price i can share is the maximum retail price which is printed on on vaccine it is 2151 per uh, combi pack uh, that the vaccine is already in the market for the last 2 3 months uh, okay. that's the price which should be charged to the patient sir and again uh, one small appeal from my side to all the doctors sitting here is that you should charge only mrp to the uh patients and add your vaccination fee separately this is my recommendation whenever i meet a doctor i say this so i am just repeating okay okay and this was a question from an audience sir that's what i asked yes sir okay so if there are no questions i think president sir will go for the vote of thanks yes please okay. please i request our treasurer dr rajendra sir to do the vote of thanks yeah good evening sir uh, before that sir one minute i want to thank dr anamalai vijayaraghavan for your words of appreciation sir for our iap tnsc for conducting such programs thank you sir yeah, good evening to everybody it is my great pleasure and privilege to deliver what up thanks and uh, first of all i thank our um, a pediatric community mark and ian dr sp sir always wherever he is going no? <laughs> yeah he is a uh, uh, star speaker and i think he is i'm so seeing so many years i think he is a uh, wonderful sp speaker I, uh, thank you sir really i thank you and uh, always i have a privilege to ask uh, to speak any topic he never refused to me thank you sir and i uh, thank that biologically he and we have supported us for this event and uh, thank you uh, dr biologically vp also and uh, mr jivan kumar and uh, dr mr balaji also i thank our uh, uh, president uh, dr arun sendil sir and uh, dr suresh palan sir and all other audience and the gathering who has attended this uh, even uh, very effectively thank you one and all thanks to all nandri vanakkam thank, thank you thank you thank you sir sbs sir yeah, thank, thank you sir thank you very much